Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. We begin with updates on the high school shooting in Georgia that killed four people. The suspect 14 year old student Colt Gray has been charged with four counts of felony murder. That's according to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. He's currently being held at a local youth detention center and is scheduled to make his first court appearance tomorrow. Georgia authorities say he is expected to be tried as an adult. Law enforcement said the shooter used an AIR style firearm. Investigators are trying to find out how the suspect was able to obtain the semi-automatic rifle, any warning signs that he would actually carry out a shooting and his motive. The four victims were identified as two 14 year old boys, Christian Angelo and Mason Shermerhorn, and two math teachers, 53 year old Christina Ermey and 39 year old Richard Aspinwall. It's still unclear whether they had any connections to the shooter and whether they were targeted. One teacher and eight students wounded in the attack remain hospitalized. They are all expected to survive. The shooting at Appalachia High School has left the community in Winder, Georgia, shaken and in grief. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has reactions to the tragedy. I still don't believe this is real. So allow God to call us for you. People in Winder, Georgia held a vigil after two students and two teachers were killed at Appalachia High School on Wednesday. This is a place where I'm supposed to feel safe. Students, families and teachers held candles and prayed for the victims just weeks after classes started. Nothing ever happened. I didn't think it would be here. One student says she was sitting next to Gray in class. When he left, she thought he was just skipping. You just hear gunshots. Uh, there's about 10 to 15 of them. The FBI in Atlanta and the Jackson County Sheriff's Office say law enforcement questioned Gray last year. They say that was over several anonymous tips about online school shooting threats, but that there was no probable cause for arrest at the time. President Biden in a statement on the shooting said we cannot continue to accept this as normal. The president called for bipartisan laws to ban so-called assault weapons in high-capacity magazines. He also urged Congress to pass bills requiring safe storage of firearms, universal background checks, and to end immunity for gun manufacturers. Vice President Kamala Harris called the school shooting a senseless tragedy during a campaign stop in New Hampshire. And it's just outrageous that every day in our country, in the United States of America, that parents have to send their children to school worried about whether or not their child will come home alive. It's senseless. It, it is. We've got to stop it. Harris thanked law enforcement and first responders and says she's praying for families and all those affected. The Republican presidential nominee, former President Trump, reacted on social media. He says his heart is with the victims and loved ones of those affected by the tragic event. Trump's VP pick, Senator J.D. Vance, responded on X. He condemned the shooting as despicable violence and says he's keeping the victims, their families, and the whole community of Winder, Georgia, in his prayers. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. German police today killing an armed man in Munich. They say he was likely planning to attack the Israeli consulate. The gunman was killed after an exchange of fire near the Israeli consulate. Police identified the suspect as an 18-year-old Austrian national. The governor of the state of Bavaria praised law enforcement after the incident and said that Jewish institutions are given a high level of protection in the area. Police say the shooter's motive remains under investigation. The incident occurred on the anniversary of the 1972 attack at the Munich Olympics in which Palestinian terrorists killed 11 Israeli athletes. Israel says it killed six terrorists in the West Bank today. Meanwhile, residents there say they are suffering from the major military operation already in its second week. NTD's international correspondent Arian Pazdar has the Israel update. Fighting in the Middle East continues. Israel's military says it killed six terrorists in the West Bank on Thursday. That's part of a major West Bank operation, which is in its second week now. Residents of a refugee camp woke up to damaged buildings and bulldozed streets. 78 years, I have never witnessed anything like this, from 1948 to 67. Nothing was like this. They used to shoot, and all but the bulldozers are new, and the damage is massive. The Israeli military says it's tearing up the streets because troops are looking for roadside bombs. Meanwhile in Gaza, a polio vaccination campaign entered its second stage on Thursday. It's the first day children can receive the vaccine in the city of Khan Yunis. 
Just as you provided us with vaccination so that our children would be safe, you must provide us with a ceasefire and a stop to this war. The Pentagon on Thursday said it's working on a peacekeeping mission in Gaza when asked if the U.S. plans to have boots on the ground after the conflict ends. The ceasefire deal, uh, that's something that the United States is working very closely on um, with our partners and allies in the region that would include some type of, you know, uh, peacekeeping force, but I don't anticipate that that would include U.S. military boots on the ground. Congressman Mike Lawler blamed Hamas for the conflict dragging on. Hamas must surrender and release the hostages. Uh, their refusal to do so, uh, and clear, it is Hamas that is refusing to enter the terms of a ceasefire. And they have violated eight ceasefires over the last 16 years. But protesters in Israel continue to blame their government. Demonstrators took to the streets again on Thursday, demanding a ceasefire deal. And this day is dedicated to all the people that were murdered in Gaza. We all know that they were alive there, and now they're not. They came back in coffins, 21 people that already came back dead from Gaza, and you know we are still have people there. The death of six hostages last week started a wave of protests. Half a million people took to the streets on Sunday. Protests have continued every day since. Arian Pastar, NTD News. President Biden is in southwest Wisconsin today announcing multi-billion dollar investments in electricity for rural areas. NTD's Washington correspondent Jack Bradley has more from the White House. President Joe Biden is announcing $7.3 billion in new infrastructure investments while in Westby, Wisconsin on Thursday. Now the money is going to 16 different corporations that's going to be spread across 23 different states. They'll be used to purchase projects including renewable energy sources like wind, solar and nuclear. Now the goal of it all is to make internet cheaper in hard to reach areas. It's the most significant transformative investment in electricity and electrification and clean energy for rural America since FDR's New Deal. You're the backbone of this country. You deserve the same resources as folks in our cities and our suburbs. And that's what today's announcement is all about. Generating rural power for rural America. Now, the funding comes from the Inflation Reduction Act, which was championed by congressional Democrats back in August 2022, but very much opposed by Republicans. But why is Biden doing this now? Well, the White House says that this is part of his Investing in America series, where he's uh, touting his successes in his Biden administration for investing in infrastructure projects like uh, replacing corroded lead pipes, as well as uh, building offshore wind farms. Now, this is Biden's first visit to Wisconsin since he dropped out of the presidential race and endorsed Kamala Harris. The election hinges on swing states like Wisconsin. Biden won the state back in 2020 by about 20,000 votes, and former President Trump won the state back in 2016 by a very slim margin there. Reporting from the White House, Jack Bradley, NTD News. Turning now to the presidential debate, it's been decided that the candidates' microphones will be muted after all. Host network ABC says the rules have been set for the first debate between Vice President Harris and former President Trump. NTD's Jason Blair has an update. According to ABC, which is hosting the debate, both former President Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris have agreed to the rules for September 10th in Philadelphia. This includes muting a candidate's microphone when it's not their turn to speak. In the announcement Wednesday, ABC said that the debate will be 90 minutes long and will have two commercial breaks. There will be no studio audience and only the moderators will be able to ask questions. ABC also said that they did the coin toss and Trump was the winner. He decided to make his closing statement last. In relation to the upcoming election, Liz Cheney says she'll be voting for Harris in November. According to reports, the former Wyoming Congresswoman made the remarks while at Duke University saying, as a conservative, as someone who believes in and cares about the Constitution, I have thought deeply about this. And not only am I not voting for Donald Trump, but I will be voting for Kamala Harris. The brother of Governor Tim Walz, Harris's running mate, has also been in the spotlight after he made comments on Facebook last week about disagreeing with his brother's policies. 
Jeff Walsh responded to a reply to one of his posts describing his brother as not the type of character you want making decisions about your future. Jeff Walsh told News Nation in an interview on Wednesday that while he stands by his comments, he didn't have the intention of influencing voters. He said his post was more about clarifying that his views are different from his brother's because people were starting to assume he supported them. Jeff Walsh also said he doesn't plan on formally endorsing Trump or any other candidate, nor do any campaigning against his brother. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jason Blair, NTD News. Ahead of next week's debate, former President Trump unveils new economic plans for a potential second term. Those include a new commission to cut spending and an overhaul of the federal bureaucracy. Entity's Iris Tao, who's covering the Trump campaign, brings us the details. Trump on Thursday unveiled a slew of economic policies, including creating a government efficiency commission to help eliminate fraud and cut government spending. Trump says Elon Musk has agreed to help lead this effort if he has time. I will create a government efficiency commission task with conducting a complete financial and performance audit of the entire federal government and making recommendations for drastic reforms. We need to do it. Can't go on the way we are now. Trump also vowed to slash government regulations and also to revoke all unused funds from President Biden's signature climate law, the Inflation Reduction Act. For four straight years, I fought for American workers like I would fight for my own family. I took care of our economy like I would take care of my own company. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris this week proposed tax deductions for small businesses and also higher taxes on millionaires and corporations. My plan will make our tax code more fair. Billionaires and big corporations must pay their fair share in tax. The two will clash directly next Tuesday on the debate stage. And tonight here in Milwaukee, Trump's allies, including North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum and Congressman Brian Stell, will hold a town hall on Trump's policies. Reporting from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Iris Tao, NTD News. And speaking of the debate, Harris and Trump will be facing off next week in Philadelphia. NTD will have on-the-ground coverage, in-depth analysis, and a lot more prepared for you during our pre- and post-debate show on The Nation to Science 2024, presented by Steve Lance and myself. Make sure to tune in next Tuesday, September 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern. A North Carolina judge has denied Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s request to get his name off the state's ballot, but the judge put the ruling on hold for 24 hours to allow Kennedy to appeal. North Carolina has no law in place to allow independent candidates to get themselves off the ballot, except if they pass away. Kennedy withdrew from the race before the August 6th deadline and threw his support behind former President Trump. Meanwhile, in Wisconsin, Kennedy filed a lawsuit after the state decided to keep him on the ballot. He argued that third party candidates are treated differently compared to Republicans and Democrats. Hunter Biden is seeking to settle his federal tax evasion case in California with a last-minute plea deal just as the trial was about to start. Entity's Christina Corona was outside the courthouse. We're here in downtown Los Angeles where Hunter Biden made a surprising announcement this morning by changing his plea to guilty on the first day of his tax evasion trial. It's been reported this announcement was made just moments before the jury selection was set to begin. Now this is known as the Alfred's plea where Biden will maintain his innocence while still accepting the guilty verdict. As we know, Biden failed to pay $1.4 million in taxes from 2016 to 2019 to fund this extravagant lifestyle which included drugs, prostitutes, luxury hotels and rental properties, and luxury cars. Now, these are nine different charges, three felony charges, and six misdemeanors, which include tax evasion, failing to file and pay taxes, and filed a fraudulent tax report. However, prosecutors opposed the Alford plea, calling it an injustice and against the rule of law. Hunter Biden then pleaded guilty to all charges, now avoiding trial. Sentencing is set for December 16th. Reporting from downtown Los Angeles, Christina Corona, NTD News. Turning now to former President Trump's legal cases, a federal judge just held the first hearing in Trump's federal election case since the Supreme Court ruling on presidential immunity. 
Judge Tanya Chutkin, who is overseeing the case at the court hearing, aimed to address two main questions, how to resolve the immunity issue and what the rest of the schedule will look like. Prosecutors and defense lawyers clash in court over the next steps. Trump was not present. He pleaded not guilty to a superseding indictment filed by special counsel Jack Smith. The hearing concluded without setting a trial date. The judge set a deadline of September 26th for prosecutors to submit their opening brief on immunity. It's expected to cover descriptions of evidence for the indictment. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A proposed 28% capital gains tax now making headlines as Vice President Kamala Harris outlines her policies for the next four years. With the election now in the home stretch, who has a better economic plan for the country? Entity's Sam Wong was out at the National Mall to hear from voters. So Trump versus Harris, who do you think has a better economic plan? I, I'd go with Trump. Maybe actually Harris? Uh, with Biden's infrastructure bill that he you know, put through and Harris's support of that, I, I would think that the uh, Harris camp. Trump, you go back four years ago and how great everything was. I did much better under Trump four years ago or three and a half years ago, so I'm, I'm leaning more that way. But right now my 401k looks fabulous. They're both for Social Security freezes, which I'm on a fixed income now other than 401ks, of course. So right now I'd have to say I'd go with Harris. So I want to kind of shift our focus to the uh, the 28% capital, uh, capital gain tax that Harris recently proposed. Uh, what do you make of that policy? That's why she's collecting the money to give it away. I enjoy paying the 28% versus 36. It might cause uh, at least uh, those like billionaires not to uh, be able to hoard their assets so much because they usually just take out loans against it. We're given opportunity to grow wealth amongst ourselves, and if we get to that point, then we need to share the, the benefits that we have gained out of growing that wealth. So where do you think the, the threshold is? Uh, you know, any, any day, any more, a million dollars doesn't seem to be very high. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I'm not sure what the threshold would be. We've got money saved, and when I pull that out, the capital gains, I don't like that to be taxed. I've saved that money after I, ta I was taxed, and then I get taxed when I pull it out. If people are making that kind of money, they're buying the big ticket items that keep people working. You're getting a break to start a business. You're taking that risk in, a, in, in an adventure. Why get penalized if your business is a success? I don't, I don't agree with that. With just 60 days remaining until the November election, Republicans and Democrats in Georgia fight for fair and free elections. Our legal correspondent Arlene Richards reviews the latest court battles that could have a significant impact on the state's general election. The clock is ticking as one of the most crucial elections in American history approaches. And it's expected to come down to a handful of states called the swing states or battleground states. A swing state plays a key role in elections because it has similar levels of support from Democrats and Republicans. A candidate's victory could come down to how many people actually vote. The most significant swing states in this year's election include Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina and Wisconsin, along with Georgia and Pennsylvania. With 16 electoral votes, Georgia is in the top 10 among all states. Eight of the last 12 candidates that won Georgia ultimately won the presidency. Georgia entered the swing state category in 2020 after President Biden became the first Democrat in 28 years to win the state. In the aftermath of the surprise win, the Republican-led Georgia legislature set out to restore what they believed was lacking, election integrity. With the governor's approval, the legislature made sweeping changes to the state's election law in 2021. Some of the many changes include not allowing individuals to wait until after the general election to register to vote. Individuals who fail to register in time won't be able to vote in a runoff election. There's also a new photo ID requirement for voting absentee by mail. Supporters of the law say it's needed to restore confidence in Georgia's elections. Those opposed say it will restrict voting access, especially for voters of color. The law set off a litany of lawsuits by liberal and civil rights advocacy groups who want to block the law from ever taking effect. So far, the Trump-appointed judge has granted one request for an injunction. That decision blocks a provision that would have rejected mail-in ballots for failing to include a birth date. 
Georgia officials appealed. With Election Day fast approaching, both sides are trying to get a final ruling on elements of the case without a trial. Meanwhile, Republican lawmakers are continuing to update the election law. In March, Georgia lawmakers approved new rules for challenging voter eligibility. The bill, signed into law by Governor Brian Kemp, could lead to voters being removed from the rolls. For example, if someone is registered at a non-residential address. And the Republican-led State Election Board last month pushed through proposed election rules that have sparked fierce debates. The new rules give county officials greater authority to refuse to certify voter tallies. A Republican board member defended the new rules. I'm not fixing a problem that does not exist. Um, actually, we're preventing problems from happening in the future. Democrats recently filed a lawsuit against the board to block the new rules, arguing that they will cause post-election chaos. In Fulton County, the largest and arguably the most controversial county in Georgia, two county citizens are suing members of the Fulton County Department of Registrations and Elections, or FCDRE. They claim the county doesn't maintain accurate voter rolls. Their suit is based in part on testimony given by the former chair of the FCDRE. Fulton County never does an independent search for anybody, dead people, felons, people who live out of state. Former President Trump was indicted a year ago by Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis. She alleges that he attempted to overturn the county's 2020 election results. An appeals court postponed that case until after this year's presidential election. Defendants had appealed the lower court's decision to not disqualify Willis. Arlene Richards, NTD News. The Justice Department says U.S. adversaries are ramping up their efforts to influence American politics and disrupt IT infrastructure. DOJ investigations point to Russia, China and North Korea as the main actors with the most sophisticated schemes. NTD's Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more. This week, the Department of Justice announced criminal charges and actions against a disinformation campaign sponsored through Russian state media. RT's editor-in-chief said the company had built, quote, an entire empire of covert projects designed to shape public opinion in Western audiences. According to the DOJ, Russian state media managed a $10 million scheme to direct a Tennessee-based media company to disseminate information favorable to the Putin regime, which included hiring social media influencers to disseminate divisive content on platforms. In a separate enforcement action, the Justice Department is seizing 32 Internet domains that the Russian government and the Russian-sponsored actors have used to engage in a covert campaign to interfere and influence the outcome of our country's elections. According to court filings, Russian President Vladimir Putin's inner circle directly managed the disinformation campaign to influence U.S. elections. We have no tolerance for attempts by authoritarian regimes to exploit our, our democratic system of government. We will be relentlessly aggressive in countering and disrupting attempts by Russia and Iran, as well as China or any other foreign malign actor to interfere in our elections and undermine our democracy. Earlier this week, a former aide to two New York governors was charged with being a foreign agent working for the Chinese Communist Party. Linda Sun, a former deputy chief of staff of Governor Kathy Hochul, and her husband, Chris Hu, have been accused of 10 crimes, including money laundering, conspiracy, and alien smuggling. And in July, the DOJ indicted North Korean nationals, charging them with using ransomware attacks to hold hospitals and healthcare providers in the U.S. hostages. According to the social media analytics firm Graphica, the CCP sponsored group Spamaflash has ramped up its dissemination of divisive content targeting conservative audiences. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. And joining me now to discuss this case is Zach Smith, former federal prosecutor and senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Zach, thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you again. Now, today's court hearing was the first in this case in nearly a year. Where does the case currently stand? How's the immunity ruling changed it? 
Well, thank you for having me on. And this is the first chance we've gotten to see all of the attorneys in the courtroom, as you mentioned, since the Supreme Court handed down its decision about presidential immunity and deciding whether or not certain actions that Donald Trump took were, in fact, immune from prosecution. And as anticipated, those immunity issues were front and center at today's hearing. A lot of the dispute resolves around the interactions that Donald Trump had with Vice President Mike Pence, whether or not he enjoys immunity for those interactions or whether Jack Smith can use those interactions as a factual predicate for some of the charges he has brought. I suspect that's what a lot of the briefing that Judge Chutkin ordered will address. Jack Smith has until the end of September, September 26th, to file his opening brief. Donald Trump's lawyers will have time shortly after that to respond. But I think what everyone recognized in the courtroom today is that there's no point in setting a trial date right now. There's still too many preliminary issues that Judge Chutkin needs to resolve. And in addition to these immunity issues, it's likely that Judge Chutkin will also be asked to resolve whether or not Jack Smith was unconstitutionally appointed and whether, if he was, that would mean the indictment that he has brought against Donald Trump would have to fall. Keep in mind, that's what Judge Eileen Cannon decided in the Florida Classified Documents case. Although based on her comments from the bench today, Judge Chutkin said she didn't find that decision particularly persuasive and seems like she would likely uh, rule in a different manner than Judge Eileen Cannon did on that very important issue. And one point that did came up today was timing. Trump's team asking to postpone the case till after the election. The judge saying that's irrelevant. Now, no trial date has been set yet, but what do you make of the election issue? Should the timing of things play into this? Well, look, I think you certainly cannot deny uh, that an election is less than two months away uh, at this point, uh, that certainly Jack Smith has been pushing as hard as he can to keep these cases moving. He's previously said he will continue pursuing these cases even after the election, even if Donald Trump wins up through Inauguration Day. And so it certainly seems like Jack Smith and the Justice Department are focused on trying to move these cases along as quickly as possible. But it's certainly undeniable that what happens in these cases will have an impact on the upcoming election if for no other reason they're taking away the time and attention of Donald Trump from being able to go out and be on the campaign trail and talk about the issues that so many Americans care about. And as you mentioned earlier, Judge Chutkin today allowed prosecutors to file court documents later this month to defend Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's revised indictment. Now, it's meant to include some fresh details, including never-before-seen evidence, such as grand jury transcripts. What does this mean for the case? Well, I think it means we still don't know exactly what is going to happen. Keep in mind, whatever Judge Chutkin rules on this immunity issue is likely to be appealed to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. On many of these issues that have come up in this case, uh, the case law, the precedent in the D.C. Circuit is not as favorable to Donald Trump as it has been in the 11th Circuit or other courts where these issues have been addressed. And so it's very possible we may see the U.S. Supreme Court being asked to take up some of these same very important issues again in the not so distant future. Uh, but again, there's a lot of legal wrangling that still has to take place, a lot of very important issues that Judge Shutkin still has to resolve before we get anywhere close uh, to a jury hearing these charges against Donald Trump. Now, also today, Hunter Biden pleaded guilty in his federal tax case to avoid a trial, and the judge has accepted his plea. Now, he's taking what's called a open plea, pleading guilty to all charges and leaving the sentencing to the judge. What does this change in terms of how he is sentenced? Yeah, this was a somewhat surprising move. Hunter Biden pled guilty as a jury was coming to the courthouse, a panel was coming to the courthouse so that they could select a jury for this case. Now, it's unusual for criminal defendants in federal court to enter into these open pleas where essentially they don't have a prearranged deal with the government uh, to plead guilty to certain charges in exchange for the dismissal of others or to plead guilty in exchange for a more lenient sentencing recommendation. What was interesting today during that guilty plea is Hunter Biden initially tried to enter what's known as an Alford plea. An Alford plea essentially is uh, where a criminal defendant denies guilt in the case but accepts that the 
prosecution has enough evidence that a jury could find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, Alfred pleas are highly unusual in federal court. In fact, the Justice Department guidance, the Justice Manual, says that United States attorneys who typically prosecute criminal cases around the country are not to enter into Alfred pleas without the express approval of very high-ranking DOJ officials. And so the DOJ lawyer, the special counsel, the lawyer on the case actually stood up and objected to that Alfred plea, which is what resulted in Hunter Biden pleading straight up uh, to the charges. Uh, So we'll have to wait and see what happens. The sentencing in this case is set to take place on December 16th. Hunter Biden could potentially face a maximum of 17 years in prison, although sentencing guidelines will likely dictate uh, that he faces a lower sentence in this tax case. But also keep in mind, this is in addition to the gun-related charges he has already already pled guilty to in Delaware. The sentencing in that case is set to take place on November 13th, and he faces up to 25 years in prison on those gun charges to which he has pled guilty. And as you mentioned, the sentencing in this case is set for December 16th, which is after the election. What do you make of the timing of that? Well, the timing certainly is interesting. It'll be very interesting to watch and see what President Joe Biden does, uh, not only before the election, but after the election as well. In the past, he has said he does not intend to pardon Hunter Biden for any of the federal charges that have been brought against him. He recently reiterated that commitment not to pardon his son Hunter. And so I think many people will be watching very closely to see whether or not uh, President Biden stays true to his word or whether he has a change of heart now that Hunter has pled guilty in both of these cases. Zach Smith, former federal prosecutor and senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you for having me on. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, tonight is the beginning of the NFL season, and we start off where we left off yesterday with the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs in action. Now this time facing a tough Baltimore Ravens squad. Yeah, and for Baltimore, they're also starting where they ended last season with a playoff loss to the Chiefs. I'm sure they haven't forgotten that. But the game was typical of how the Chiefs won last year, a dominating the defense that really contained MVP Lamar Jackson. Mainly, meanwhile, they got just enough offense with Patrick Mahomes really trying to get as much out of that underwhelming group of wide receivers as he could. Now, they've almost completely overhauled their receiver room in this offseason, though. They signed Marquise Brown. They drafted Xavier Worthy in the first round. And meanwhile, last year's top receiver, Rasheed Rice, He might avoid league punishment, at least for now, after his legal problems in the offseason. But on paper, there's a very good chance that their receiver group is much improved uh, from last year. But as I said yesterday, I'm not betting on anyone winning a third straight Super Bowl. Well, moving to soccer news, American great Alex Morgan announced her retirement on social media today. Now, naturally, her place in women's soccer history is certainly secure, but was this expected? You know, at the beginning of the year, maybe not, though she is 35, but when she was off, left off the women's Olympic soccer team this summer, that could have been a sign. Now, she said today, though, that early in the year, she knew this would be her last season. In any case, she'll leave the game, you know, a two-time World Cup champion and Olympic gold medalist. She ranks fifth in U.S. national team history with 123 goals store scored i mean she's one of the best now she also announced that she's pregnant with her second child so of course congratulations to her and her husband now currently she plays for the san diego wave uh, fc and her final game she said will be this sunday looking at college sports big 12 commissioner brett yormark said meetings with uconn reportedly about potentially joining the conference have been paused now did he give a reason why or maybe when they would resume Well, he said they jointly decided to focus on the school year, and there is a lot going on. I mean, the league added four new schools this year. They lost their big two of Oklahoma and Texas. Then This is a year after adding four more schools. And per an ESPN report, the talk stalled because of all these recent changes. And there's even more going on right now. There's an ongoing lawsuit from former athletes against the NCAA and the Power Five conferences that could be settled soon. And the settlement could have schools essentially paying athletes themselves for the name, image, and likeness. That would definitely change how college athletics operates. Now, in any case, it would be kind of an unusual fit for UConn. You know, geographically wise, most of the Big 12 is in the Midwest. Plus, the Huskies football program would certainly have an uphill battle facing that competition. But their men's and women's basketball programs are top notch. Plus, of course, they would be the very coveted New York City audience. So there's plenty of value there. 
Shifting gears to tennis, the U.S. Open continues tonight with the women's semifinals. Now, you've talked about Coco Goff and Iga Swiatek being the favorites to win, but both are eliminated. So who would you say is the remaining favorites? Well, I'm not going to count out the two Americans. We've got 12th-ranked Emma Navarro, 6th-ranked Jessica Pagula. They'll definitely have the crowd behind them tonight. Now, Navarro is going to need it the most. She plays Arena Sabalenka, who's ranked second in the world. Now, this is her fourth straight appearance at the U.S. semifinals. She actually lost to Coco Goff in the finals last year, but she's yet to win the title. She is the remaining favorite. Now, in the other matchup, you have, you know, Pagula, who upset number one, run, number one ranked Iga Swiatek yesterday. She did it with a lot of ease, you know, just in straight sets, 6-2, six, 6-4. Six, now, her opponent tonight, Karolina Mokova, is ranked somewhere in the 50s currently, but she was ranked in the top 10 just a year ago. She had a wrist injury problem that knocked her out of a lot of uh, matches this year. So she plays Pagula in the later match. That's going to start at 8.30 Eastern time. Emma Navarro plays Arena Sabalenka in the first match starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Well, Davis Owens, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. Should the Olympic ring stay on the Eiffel Tower permanently? The Paris mayor says they should, but not everyone agrees, and a deadline for the idea is coming very soon. NTD's international correspondent David Vivez has the story. The Olympic Games have been a success with nearly 9 million tickets sold. Now, after the game ended, many French had a sense of nostalgia as everything goes back to normal. But does that mean that we should forever keep the Olympic rings on the Eiffel Tower? The Olympic rings were supposed to be removed after the Paralympics, but now the Paris mayor says they should stay. She calls them a symbol of the Games' success and says they highlight how the Olympics revitalized Paris. But not everybody is on board with the idea. I do think it's symbolic and we have to keep them because it's a symbol of uh, two weeks of Olympics and ten days of Paralympics where this city has been a feast for everybody and it's got to be kept. I don't know how long for, but it's got to be kept. I think they should be removed because the Olympic Games are over. Nostalgia isn't very good for morale, so we have to move on. The descendants of the man who designed the Eiffel Tower said the rings should come down. The engineer's great-great-grandson agrees the rings were a nice touch during the games, but he says the Eiffel Tower should not be turned into a permanent advertisement. A petition against keeping the rings has already gathered over 36,000 signatures. I think the rings are a great reminder of the games. Keeping them until the end of the year makes sense, but when the Los Angeles games come around, does it still make sense? As far as I'm concerned, the games belong to everyone, not just Paris. So taking them away would also make sense. The Paralympics closing ceremony is this Sunday. If there is no agreement on the rings before then, the Iron Lady will return to her original state. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. California's fire agency reports over 5,000 wildfires have burned in the state's 2024 fire season. As the heat wave continues in the U.S., those in the fire prevention industry share how to protect homes using technology and sprays. NTD's David Lamb reports. According to a fire expert, fire weather is often overlooked and that poses a serious threat to homes. Certified wildfire mitigation specialist Stuart Mitchell tells NTD it's no joke when there's low humidity, high heat, and high winds. It's really important that people pay attention to predicted fire weather, and that's given by the National Weather Service. And predicted fire... He talked about a free tool from watchduty.org. It locates where the wildfires are not only near you, but all throughout all of California and other states. Mitchell says if there's time before an evacuation, put away all combustible items far away from the house. So, for example, uh, umbrellas, propane tanks, seat cushions, anything that's combustible around the perimeter of your home, it's really helpful to put that into the garage, if you don't have a garage, to at least to move that material away from the home, maybe 20, 30 feet away. In addition, if dry brush hasn't been maintained or trimmed, Mitchell says applying fire retardants is another option, which are spray-on substances that prevent burning or slow the spread of fire. Firefighters and pilots use the bright colored retardant to keep track of where it's sprayed. But homeowners can use transparent retardants or ones that become transparent over time.
Jack Kimmick's job at Komodo Fire Systems is to apply retardant to homes and land, even when the fire is burning. Now we can steer the fire. So if there's an archeological site or there's a home uh, area that we don't wanna burn, we can steer that fire away from it during a controlled burn. With the park fire in 2024, the Pacific Northwest is facing hundreds of wildfires right now. Uh, it's a global problem, right? It's not a west coast of the United States. Uh, we have uh, Greece burning. We have had fires in the Mediterranean. Uh, earlier this year, we had um, over 100 people that died in South America, in, in Chile. In the long run, the founder of Komodo says fire impacts generations of people, pointing to residue from burned property, chemicals, vehicles that eventually get seeped into the ground and potentially connecting to farmland and water streams. He believes new tech, including drones, can be leveraged to fight against fire. Or we have unmanned systems that are um, designed to protect your property, whether you're home or not. Sabari says education, awareness, and an open mind could help change the firefighting landscape. In Morgan Hill, California, David Lamb, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. For round the clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.